Welcome back. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. My guest today, Mr. Colin Benio, is the franchise growth strategist for a really dynamic concept called the melting pot. The concept is all about celebration and interactive experiences where you're literally cooking at your table. It's all about fondue and decadent food and entrees and a full beverage program, including specialty cocktails, beer and wine, really dynamic marketing. And there's so much to learn here, so many key nuggets and also give back to the community and a bigger cause. So it's got everything. You're not going to want to miss this. Thanks so much to the sponsors this week. And let me tell you about the Restaurant Rockstars Academy. Whether you're starting your very first restaurant or you've been in business a while and you just want to refine your marketing, your cost controls, and how to maximize profit, staff training for service and salesmanship and efficiencies across your organization. It's really the perfect training system to up-level your management team and Now, you can literally give access to up to 25 people for free in your organization so that they learn to run your business for you. It's all at the Restaurant Rockstars Academy at restaurantrockstars.com. Now, on with the episode. You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Rockstars, there are many elements to consider when growing your restaurant. Are you connecting with diners enough and with the right message? Could your kitchen be putting out more orders than your dining areas have room for? Well, it can be overwhelming, especially when the reason you got into this business is for the food and the people. That's why restaurants get Pop Menu. Pop Menu is the marketing tech platform designed to make growing your restaurant easy, so you don't have to grow it alone. With Pop Menu, you can capture more guests and their preferences through your restaurant's website that's designed to easily collect contact information and data so you can see what your guests love and why they dine with you. Connect and build authentic relationships with guests by using modern technology that personalizes marketing. Make all your systems work better together, improve margins, and conquer the chaos of your restaurant's digital presence. Pop Menu has a special offer for my listeners. For a limited time, get $100 off your first month plus lock in one unchanging monthly rate at popmenu.com slash rockstars. Go now to get $100 off your first month at popmenu.com slash rockstars. Listen, when I ran restaurants, I had my core values, the things most important to how I ran my restaurants, monitoring daily operations, training my team for consistently great guest experiences, food safety, quality assurance, and preventative maintenance. All this took a system. Well, here's what Xenia can do. Xenia gives you a modern app, really an operational base camp that scales standard operating procedures, trains your team, controls operations, and even manages food safety. Now, I really like their sensors that continuously monitor temperature for fridges and freezers so you can proactively prevent inventory losses. Now, how valuable is that? Now, whether managing a single or multiple locations, the Xenia app helps you ensure consistency, compliance, and accountability across your operation. You can see full detail in real time from anywhere in your Xenia dashboard with automated reports right to your inbox. Now, again, this was vital in my restaurants. Xenia is offering my listeners white glove service with free onboarding and implementation so you can jump straight into immediate usage and value. Xenia starts at just $69 per month per location. So get my special deal at www.xenia.team slash rockstars. Xenia is spelled X-E-N-I-A. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. And Colin, welcome to the show today. So happy you're here. How are you? Roger, doing good. Pleasure to be on. Awesome. Coming live from Sarasota, Florida. Can't wait to talk to you (laughs) all about the melting pot. So let's start with your backstory in hospitality. When did it all begin for you? Yeah. uh, Well, I was born and raised in Tampa and uh, originally was a uh, buster at a place called Rice & Co. at the Citrus Park Mall way back in the day, right when it kind of opened up and it was a yep. hot place to be in Tampa. Awesome. Um, and, and then from there, dishwasher at uh, a famous joint in the Tampa, which uh, unfortunately is not there anymore, Mama's Pizza. Um, but ultimately I went off to school. Uh, I played uh, soccer in college and, uh, you know, tried to focus on a career in, in sports. And I wanted to be that, uh, you know, that next 
a great player from uh, from America to make it big. But uh, when I was leaving college, I needed a job to kind of uh, subsidize what I was doing back home as I was training. Mm -hmm. And I actually ended up uh, serving at the Melting Pot Restaurant in Tampa, Florida. Um, oh, you know. Yeah. But, you know, you let in too many goals as a goalkeeper and, uh, you know, they're not asking anymore if you want to join the team. So <laughs> I essentially had to uh, make my way to a life of what I wanted to follow. And a uh, district manager asked me if I was interested in kind of taking the leadership that I had that he had seen in me and, and bringing it down to Sarasota from Tampa. So went there, uh, saw the facility, saw everything I was interested in, knew the brand, loved it uh, and was there for 15 years of operation as a manager a uh, little time in, back in st pete but ultimately that was my home for a long time as it is now that's a good story what sport are we talking about hockey or soccer soccer i was uh i played since i was in third grade uh -huh. loved it and uh yeah. i think uh they put me in goal just because i was the tall kid and i was the only one that could you know reach the bar but other than right. that it, it was a passion of mine for a long long time well, right on. Let's talk about the history of the brand called Melting Pot. It's a really unique concept. And I believe you're in 30 plus states in Canada across the country. There's a tremendous amount of locations. But let's talk about where it all began and what's the history of the brand. And then we're going to dive into the nuts and bolts of what makes it special. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Melting Pot itself is special just because of what we do. But the story of how everything started is even uh, more interesting because the gentleman, Bruce and Roy, who started the melting pot in 1975 in Maitland, just a little north of Orlando, they were looking for a concept or something that they could get interested in that not anyone else was doing at that point. So fondue was not a something that you regularly saw in any town. And they said, well, let's go ahead and do this. And the funny part about it is that Bruce and Roy have been to a lot of our conferences, so operators conferences, franchisees conferences, mm -hmm. and they have spoke about their adventure and everything they did in order to start this brand. And I'll tell you what, I don't know how I'm talking to you right now because Bruce and Roy were not restaurant guys. They were, they had no idea what they were doing. They were running around like crazy. The stories they share are absolutely hilarious about how they started the brand and got off. But at the end of the day, they were smart businessmen and they knew what they do. And they knew what they needed to do. They knew their costs. And eventually they moved their second store to Tallahassee and from there, uh, the Johnston brothers were actually interested in the brand. They worked at that location and they came to Bruce and Roy and eventually said, hey, we would like to franchise this concept with your blessing. And sure enough, the store was handed off and the Johnston brothers uh, started their location down in Tampa, Florida for the headquarters. But the interesting part about the story, even more so, is that there was a third brother who joined the team. This was the dishwasher. This was a 15-year-old Bob Johnston, and he had no money. He essentially just went to his brothers and said, how do I get involved with this? What do I do? And so he literally dishwashed his way into equity of this business. That's and awesome. as of today, I meet twice a week with the CEO of the company, Bob Johnston. So The dishwasher uh, to CEO. Awesome. It's the story. Yeah. You know, it's, that's it's his first job and his last job. That's what he always tells us. <laughs> well, now that's tremendous. And, uh, you know, I often say this, but this is an industry that if you've got a passion and if you really care about hospitality and the chemistry that restaurants are all about and meeting new people, whether that's the guests or other fellow team members, you can take this as far as you can all the way to the executive suite with no formal education. It just takes, you know, that fire in the belly, the willingness to learn, to really apply yourself and set yourself apart. And that is prime example. I think that's tremendous. I love it. Thanks so much for sharing that story. So fondue. Now, I'm a big fan of Switzerland. It's like I've been to Switzerland numerous times. I'm a skier. Mm -hmm. I'm a climber. And to me, fondue, it's either a Swiss or it's an Austrian dish by origin, is it not? Correct. Swiss. Yeah. Okay. It's a Swiss dish. And it's like, you can't walk in any restaurant in a lot of Europe where that's Germany and Austria and Switzerland and fondue is a thing. And it really brings people together. And one of the things that really struck me, I visited your website. I think it's very well done by the way. It really invites you in. So Thank you. really great job on the website, but it really shows you about the, the bonding and the connection that people have when they have dining experiences. It yep. seems like the perfect celebratory concept, I guess. Is that how you describe it? I think it's the best way to describe it. 
we yeah. work in a business that is very interesting. You know, when restaurants across America feed people, they are providing a service and a moment for people to enjoy. But the way that we do things is that we kind of take that concept and run full force with it. You know, we have people coming into our restaurant that are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries, as a lot of people do with a lot of different restaurants. Of course. But the concept of fondue is to slow down, enjoy what's happening at the table as much as the people that are around the table with you. So I've personally saw that uh, running the restaurants as long as I did. You know, I was there for 15 years watching families come back time after time, and you would see the progression of these folks grow up. I mean, I, I I knew I was in the restaurant business a long time when I was seeing, you know, young kids who had celebrated their, you know, sixth or eighth birthday, and then they were telling me about their plans for college and where they were heading off to. So we have kind of made a concept that connects people to what we do, the the culture, the food, and really the opportunity to stop, slow down, and enjoy a time together and a moment that they're going to remember forever. So that's that's really the selling point of what we do as a brand, and it's a value we hold dear. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Now you use a a term um, experiential dining because you're providing mm -hmm. a real experience. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Like walk us through as an audience, if we've never been to a melting pot before and we pull into the parking lot, take us through the walking through the front door, the sights, the sounds, the smell, the vibe. It's like the camaraderie. Of, what's a typical experience like? It's it's a many things I'm sure, but there's definitely aromas and, and celebration mm -hmm. and all that going on. But I've never yeah. been into one and I'm really intrigued to visit one now. So, but take us through the experience if you would. Yeah. Well, traditionally we do four courses at the restaurant, a cheese fondue at the beginning, salad, entree course, and obviously a chocolate fondue at the end, which everyone was excited about. Sure. Um, but the way I describe it is that we are a concept that people circle on their calendar. You know, that we are a different kind of uh, eating, dining experience, that experiential dining. So when people come to us, a lot of times there's a level of anticipation, really, that I kind of have noticed as a as an operator for a long time that people are excited to come in. There's very few times that people come to Melting Pot and are just hungry just to eat. And that happens. But at the same time, I feel like Melting Pot is kind of a, a like you're saying, experiential dining that people are circling on the calendar they might skip lunch knowing full well that they're coming to a four course dinner because it's a yeah, big yeah. meal it's indulgent um, right in some ways there's no question about it yeah i mean yeah. you're you're essentially taking a very simple concept of culinary but what you're doing is exploiting things that we have focused in on for the side great drink exceptional food beautiful service great atmosphere all those things incorporate into what I think people walk away with when they have a dining experience with us. So it's memories that last for a long time. It's the the, the cheese that you chose that you know you could pull off the uh, the fork and go all the way to the ceiling with. It's oh yeah, you know, gooey, great chewy, salads. yeah, awesome. Yep, the entree itself too is, and a lot of people sometimes don't understand this is that it is a you cook table side the entree choices that you choose. So the cooking style is on the table, on the cooktop, which every table has one or multiple. Mm -hmm. And the cook, all the food comes out unprepared. And so you're taking small bite-sized perfect pieces, steak, lobster, duck, chicken, shrimp, ahi tuna, whatever it is. Oh, wow. And you're cooking it for a very short time to pull out. Yep. And then you have the optional sauces to dip into. So you have, wow. you know, the teriyaki glaze or the ginger plum or our famous green goddess, which, I mean, people go crazy over with mm -hmm. the stuffed mushrooms that we do. So you have a lot of, of people coming in, kind of getting ready for an experience, you know, happy to be there, happy to talk about it, happy to talk about life that's happening. But at the same time, they're all enjoying the experience of what's happening on the table. Wow. You know, I'd call that a real competitive advantage because the restaurant industry is by far one of the most, if not the most competitive business I can think of. Yet this concept is so unique and different and has so many, you know, what I would call key success factors that add to the appeal. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, there's competition, but not as unique as this. So that's really awesome. Now, I remember being a kid. I grew up in the 70s and 80s and whatnot. And I remember it's like you could buy fondue pots and it was kind of a big thing in the <laughs> 70s, you know, and it would yeah. come with the little forks or the skewers, whatever you want to call them and stuff. And it was like yep. an at-home thing to do. And that was like a trend and it kind of lost favor. 
but this isn't trendy. Like this has staying power. Like you go to a restaurant for that experience. You, you're at, what's really unique again, as you mentioned, is it's being cooked. You cook it right there at the table and you've got this complete variety of foods, the seafood, the steak, and then the chocolate dessert. That's really decadent. Let's talk about the kinds of cheeses that work well. Is it yeah. Swiss cheeses like Emmentaler or is it different? I mean, can you choose your cheeses? Tell us about that. So the great part about us is, speaking of competitive edges, is yeah. having partners like we do. We work with a company called Emmy Roth out of Wisconsin. And I always tell people, as far as cheese goes, Wisconsin. this is the, the Ferrari of cheese. This company okay. is yeah. absolutely incredible. Awesome. They make proprietary cheese blends just for us. And some of those cheese blends are, like you're saying, the Swiss blend with the Gruyere and the Emmentaler. Yes. Amazing. Mm -hmm. You've got a cheddar blend that is absolutely incredible and then a fontina butter case cheese for a little bit more creamy a little bit mm -hmm. softer but yeah. at the end of the day these are cheeses that you can't get anywhere else these are cheeses that are made just for us at our almost 100 stores across the united states and canada and when you come in it's an experience that you can't you know make anywhere else that you're getting just for us mm, beautiful that's fantastic let's talk about company culture how would you describe mm. your company culture at the melting pot yeah, I would say the first thing first is that you have uh, pillars of uh, values that we make sure are in place, not only from the store level, but the franchisees and employees and how they come in. We provide what we essentially call the perfect night out. And that is the dedication to recognizing the fact that the people that are coming into this restaurant are happy to be there. And we want to make sure they're even happier when they leave. So happy team members, uh, immaculate inviting surrounding areas. Uh, and ultimately exciting and uh, beautiful food to, to have on the table. So when you have a culture that quite frankly, kind of makes the work environment great to be in, not only from a guest perspective, from the employee standpoint, that's why I stuck with Melting Pot as long as I have. I just understand the difference of what we're doing versus a lot of concepts. And it makes sense. It makes sense to me. It makes sense to our guests. And it makes sense to our franchisees that are you know growing and doing great in this community. Okay, excellent. That's that's terrific. I mean, there's a huge difference between having a real true culture that everyone buys into, that everyone follows. It's it's almost like a guiding light versus a mission statement that, you know, is kind of old and tired, but a true company culture really yep. builds that team spirit. And it sounds like you've got that going. So a follow-up to that would be, as long as we've got this really solid company culture, how do you impart that to new employees? What's the onboarding and the training philosophy like within individual stores? Because it is a yeah. franchise after all. You've got to maintain consistency, yet that is a, a pillar of hospitality, right? The staff yeah. at the foundation of your business. So let's talk about some of your training philosophies and the onboarding process. Yeah. Well, training and education is massive in any hospitality setting, but Melting Pot does a really great job at it with a company uh, approach called You Melt. It's our online training. I think you get the uh, the pun there, but yeah, uh -huh. You yeah. Melt is the yeah. uh, <laughs> the university yeah. online training course oh, that we great. provide every positional uh, job in the company. That's from the dish palace to the line to the bartender, to the hospitality specialist, and obviously the servers. So every person has the same training that they would experience. So whether you're in Sarasota, Florida, or uh, uh, Bellevue, Washington, or anywhere else in the United States, that's the same culture that we're imparting on people. So it's not only just the standard operating procedures, which are uh, you know powerful and you need to know those things, but the culture itself. You know, wh What is the mission? What are we trying to accomplish every night when people come in here? And that's everyone's responsibility. It's not just the managers who's you know opening the door and locking up at the end of the night. It's anyone that has that involvement with the guest. And I would say the culture itself extends even further into how much we do with St. Jude's Children's Hospital too. This is a Beautiful. national yeah. uh, campaign that we work with. We are a part of their program called Thanks and Giving. And I think in a total, I think we are close to $20 million uh, total that we've had. And we had a great year last year based on the fact that we broke a million dollars for the first time ever. And so much so that our dedication to it is that if you see Bob Johnston on our videos online, he's got a little less hair because Bob did say, if you guys make a million dollars in donations to St. Jude, I will shave my head live on our leadership exchange live to the entire melting pot community. And he, true to his word, he's walking around with a nice shaved head. So he, he's as committed as anybody. 
That's a wonderful cause. I mean, that's life-threatening diseases for children at no cost to the family. And mm. they have some amazing success stories. So that's a long tradition, but what a beautiful thing. And wow, there's a give back. Tremendous. And oh, yeah. Bob, you know, Bob shaved his head to make the goal happen. <laughs> What's he going to do next year to top that goal? <laughs> Yeah, we're looking at his eyebrows. We'll figure out what we're going to do. <laughs> okay, that, that's so cool. Now, I understand that this brand is going through sort of a makeover. You're remodeling stores. Um, how extensive is that? And what was the old kind of versus the new? And that's creating a huge buzz in the marketplace, right? It's it's a complete freshening. Does it go beyond yep. that? Tell us about the the remodel. Yeah, I think a lot of people, because of who we are, which is a legacy brand that's been around for, as of this April, 48 years that's a big time for a, a franchise opportunity to be around, uh, mm -hmm. given what we are in the hospitality and the, you know the competition levels we have. But what we did was essentially look at our our buildings and our plans for new build and say we need to keep up with what's happening. We need to do a different approach. And so our construction design team, along with others, came across what we call melting pot evolution, MPE, as we say internally. But this is a complete kind of new approach to what we did. So back in the day, you would have melting pots, which some people might be aware of that were, you know, very closed, very dark, very romantic, uh, you know, tight tables and, you know, that intimacy that used to be a great thing that people were attracted to. We still have some options for that. We call it lover's lane. It's always in every melting pot, those little two tops for those special anniversaries and birthdays. Valentine's Day must but be But we've huge. seen the consumers <laughs> change. Consumers are now yeah. open to different ways to kind of experience restaurants. It's not always the same thing. And we recognize that a lot of our stores were kind of focused on the dining room and the bar was a second option, not any longer. We are now approaching the consumer to experience Melting Pot in a number of different ways. It, it doesn't always have to be that date night. It could be, you know, a ladies night out. It could be after, drink, after work drinks and cheese. It could even be someone coming from another restaurant who's coming just to have chocolate at the bar. So we've kind of opened up the possibility of different sales areas, different revenue centers, and lightened up the atmosphere, much more open, much more uh, decadent, and just really keeping up with trends. And that's not only been uh, through our entire brand, which by June of next year, every melting pot will have gone through this MPE renovation, but all the new builds as well. They're all in the fashion of making sure that, you know, we optimize the square footage that we're using and we're providing our guests the way that they want to experience fondue because it's not always the same. How many seats are in a typical melting pot and square footage of a typical location? Depends on each one. You know, we yeah. uh, it depends on the market as well. I think what we do is appropriately place restaurants size wise the way they uh, need to be in the restaurants. But I would say square footage, you're looking at typically around 4,500, around 5,700 is that sweet mm -hmm. spot to really yeah, find a, a great size, space. Good size store for sure. Okay. Yeah. That, that gives us an idea. So you mentioned bar. Is it a full bar? Is it just beer and wine? What do you offer? No, oh, no, no. Uh, Ann Fontana, if she's listening, she'd be very remiss if I didn't talk about a great liquor program that we do. But uh, full, full bar. Yeah. You've got great options for beer, mm -hmm. great options for cocktails, which are very popular. And obviously wine is a natural pairing. So we go all the way. Every melting pot we have has to make sure that we do that because our uh, cocktails and wine and alcohol, phenomenal. We do very, very well with that. And we're progressing and making new options for guests all the time. That's very appealing to a potential franchisee. You know, not every franchise in this restaurant space has a full bar. And obviously bars, you know, provide so much profit to an operation. And it obviously gives a, a, a bigger draw for people to want to come. So thanks for mm -hmm. sharing. Now, the pandemic really opened up a new opportunity in many states to do cocktails to go. And then a lot of mm -hmm. states continued that because it was such a big hit. And it, it you know, some people would say it even helped you know, revitalize the industry and definitely keep a lot of businesses alive. Do you guys have a alcohol to go program? Can you have cocktails that are sealed and out the door kind of thing? Or did you I think it depends do? state to state, but I know in Florida when I was going through that, uh, you know, quite frankly, very scary time in my life, yes. you know, I, know. I, I everyone was, you know, was, the hospitality industry really got rocked. You know, you had a lot of people wondering, you know, what are we doing? What are we doing next? But the support that we got from Melting Pot was phenomenal. I mean, we essentially lost no melting pots during that time. That's amazing. Because we dropped essentially the sales department. We didn't really want to focus on growth, knowing where people were mm -hmm. and, the, and yep. the, how scared they were. So Bob and team 
went in and said, we need to make sure that we are taking care of, of our family, which we essentially call them because yeah. uh, that's who they are. You know, these are men and women who have invested into an opportunity that isn't competitive with other things, with other uh franchisees. So if you see a melting pot, they're more than likely is not a melting pot for a long distance because we understand the range of what we grow go to and uh and can reach. So when we're existing in, in uh stores, we can actually see data to know how far their reach is, to understand what uh demographics they're working with. So the job of the team is to go in, find those demographics, figure out who's uh you know coming to the melting pot and place new growth, not in a competitive, you know, cannibalistic way with those current uh stores but back to alcohol yeah i think some of us did and i remember us doing it in florida for quite a bit but now the focus really is is ex exceptional food and beverage and we do a really good job with that at the bar specifically because there are cooktops on the bar too mm -hmm. so when you come in and eat you actually can have a full four courses there or any course you want um but you know if you're sitting at a bar you got a great bartender right there to serve yeah. up, you know classic drinks like the yin yang that we, everyone loves or the love martini i'm a big fan of the freshly picked margarita that's my go to every time i'm a margarita guy i can see yeah. i can hear it. so there's okay so we got beer wine full bar you can get you know your tangerine and tonic if you want but you also have a mm. specialty cocktail program with specialty drinks that sort of accompany and complement the the fondue experience as well that sounds great yeah Got it all dialed. You know, when I eat out, um, my wife and I like to sit at the bar for, in many ways. Sometimes we'll mm -hmm. have a table if it's a special occasion, but there's something really fun about sitting at a bar and interacting with the bartender and just being part of that whole scene. And it sounds like you've got that going on as well. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about branding is really powerful. Again, mm. all, all this is, is visible on the website, but I, I want to emphasize to the audience the importance and the power of having really unique and creative names, not only for menu items, but for special promotions. Now you've got special theme nights. Wednesday mm -hmm. is Friends Day. And I love, you know, Thursday date night, which is really yep. cool. Right. And that's for romance, of course. Yeah. Have a date or whatever. And, and there's something going on all the time, but it's it's a reason to come back again and again and and reach multiple demographics and different peoples, depending on what they're looking for. You know, savor every moment is a tagline. Mm -hmm. It's like you got it going on. You must have a great, you know, marketing and graphics department, too. Like I said, I've been with this company for a long time and I've seen almost a revolution on how good this marketing team is. Anna Malmquist along with others like Justin Cross, uh, Carmen Murillo, they are taking what we are doing and putting the data and the science behind what a true branding effort looks like. I mean, this is not a coincidence. This is not luck. This is a true dedication to these men and women who are seeing what Melting Pot is and taking full advantage of it. I mean, I like I said, back in the day, you know, if you put, put on a beer dinner, there was some cursory information and, you know, good uh -huh. luck and you yeah. had to pick your... Not any longer. I mean, they've essentially said, well, we're going to make these national programs that, you know, put emphasis on certain dates. So the best friend, Fondue Friends Forever, BFFF on Wednesday, the great thing to come out for people mm -hmm. just doing a couple courses, a couple drinks with friends. Like you mentioned, Thursday date. I mean, that was literally because when we researched the days of the week, we saw Thursday as a massive opportunity we were not taking advantage of. So Anna and friends essentially went in, saw this market, saw this opportunity and said, we need to create a moment. We need to create a reason. And Thursday is that reason. It's that romantic night to come out, relax. It's not the weekend, but you probably have the babysitter. It's great. They do an amazing job at that. And so I can say full heartedly, the franchisees we have in place now are trusting and, and happy with the way that the marketing efforts are going now more than ever. Yeah. Another reason to obviously have interest and to be a franchisee of this company. You've got all the pieces put together, but marketing is mm. definitely a foundational building block and it appears to be very well done. You know, let's talk about your loyalty. You've got something called the Fondue Club. How does it work? Yep. I mean, we've got the loyalty of uh, Club Fondue going in every restaurant. What you're doing mm -hmm. is getting all the information about how you come in, when the events are coming, email. I think it's pretty standard, but you know, yeah. the standout of what we do uh -huh. is we sign up for that birthday chocolate covered dip strawberries when you come in and let the hospitality specialist know on your reservation. So uh, that's a nice way to do it. But it's a great thing for us at a level because we're able to use that data and understand who our guests are to understand what they want and what they're desiring. And so they do a really nice job of taking information and saying, how, how can we serve these folks better? 
You mentioned several times the term hospitality specialist. Is that referring <laughs> to the the host greeters at the door? They're your first mm-hmm. sort of line of offense and the last person you see on the way out the door that's a not only a greeter, but a brand ambassador that really sort of takes you by the hand and shows you or demonstrates the yeah. experience and makes you feel welcome and at home. Is that what that's all about? Yeah, there's a couple of different phrases we use because I think we uh, see service a little bit differently than most yeah. people. So uh-huh. our host disposition, as most people know, it is the hospitality specialist. We want to make like sure that. that they understand, you know, they're not just the person, you know, opening the door and, and walking people to the table. They are the first line of conversation, of sight, taking care of the front of the restaurant and make sure everything looks great. So as important as any server, bartender, or, or person in the kitchen is, they are equally as important. So we want to make sure we emphasize that. But some of the other things, like I, when I mentioned the the dishwasher, we call it the dish palace. We don't call it the I dish I heard you say that. We, the dish you know, palace. I've never nice heard that clean. before, but that is really cool. Back of house is yeah. usually referred to in the kitchen. We refer to it as the heart of house because that's where everything starts. That's how yeah. the restaurant beats. So if the kitchen is rocking and rolling on a Saturday night, you know it really quickly how, how great things can move when the kitchen's on point. Really makes people take pride in what they're doing too, I think. You mm-hmm. know, uh, Dish pit is sort of a derogatory term. Dish palace sort of elevates it and makes you feel like, hey, this is a special position. It's critical to the back, to the heart of house. It's critical yeah. to the front of house. And you start here, you can become CEO. <laughs> Give Bingo. them a couple of years, but you could be the nice Bob and shave your head. For, you know, exactly. I mean, but that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you've thought through so many details here. That's great. You know, what else works for marketing? Do you have a big social media sort of strategy as well? Or, how, oh, yeah. you know, what's proven um, to work? So I think the good thing to mention when we talk about franchising is that mm-hmm. a lot of people don't come from a hospitality background. You know, I have people that we talk to, I mean, literally currently right now, I just came back from Texas talking to some folks, they have no restaurant experience, but what we provide them is the systems in place to get to where they need to go, have the backing, have the understanding and the experience of professionals, 65 plus people running Tampa, Florida and out in the field, you know, for a hundred stores. So they have massive backings for things like marketing. A great example is that. Uh, every person is tasked with AOR of running their own store, area of responsibility. So they are in task to provide marketing and the efforts and things that they want to do. But the thing that they have in their back pocket is a brand ambassador. Every restaurant has a marketing specific person provided to them to guide them, to help them. This is things like making sure they're you know on the local television spots, where they're spending their uh, dollars. And we also have a co-op spend that goes into a national campaign to help the, the brand in a whole. So when we talk about marketing, again, the support is fully there. If you know what you're doing or you don't, you've got the background. True hospitality and guest convenience are vital in your restaurant. I'm proud to say that for 23 years, my restaurants provided both with paging equipment by JTEC. We used guest and server pagers, and my teams could not have delivered great dining experiences without them. JTEC systems help you run a great restaurant. Now, JTEC pagers are reliable, durable, easy to set up and operate. Guest pagers increase sales and give guests peace of mind knowing they'll be called when their table's ready. Staff pagers notify when orders are up, fresh, and ready, and save time by eliminating the need for servers to check on orders. JTEC also offers Motorola two-way radio solutions, QR code virtual paging, reservations management, curbside notifications, and, coming soon, Linkware, a wearable watch-like smart band that can receive messages and tasks from the JTEC Linkware application. Now, I saw this product at a recent food show, and it's really cool. To learn more and get a special offer from JTEC exclusively for my listeners, go to www.jtech.com slash rockstars. That's spelled J-T-E-C-H dot com slash rockstars. That's tremendous. And obviously locational specialists and helping people choose the right location and then build out of the stores and all that oh, stuff boy, is yeah. fully supported. So you must have tremendous leverage with suppliers as well, the economies of scale thing, because one of the challenges obviously is inflation and cost of goods. Mm -hmm. Is your menu, has your menu been impacted much with rising costs? I mean, the cheese, has that been really volatile? Obviously steak and seafood and all those things. And how have you dealt with that? We've done a very nice job at it. I mean, we have a team in place for 
purchasing and distribution that are you know buying at large levels for contracted things. So a lot of the items like our cheeses and our meats are going to our uh, stores because they're on a bigger buying power. Now we source locally for things like produce as most restaurants do. Costs are up. I mean, that that's the bottom line, but the way that we balance that is you know, making sure that we provide a meaningful service that people, when they get that bill and they say, you know, we spent a lot, but I didn't feel like it. I felt like the experience was there. And that's something we hang our hat on. We have for a long time. So let's move over to the labor equation because everyone's talked about labor in this business for the past two years. It's been the biggest challenge to the industry and some concepts, I'm guessing yours based on your company culture has had less of a challenge than others. Primarily, I'm getting the sense that this is a leadership organization versus a management organization. And those are two different things. And the way you make people feel and the way you elevate them and give them opportunities and responsibilities tends to lower turnover and increase longevity. But have you had much of an impact with with labor and, and the high cost of labor and all those things? They all come to, I mean, at the end of the day, the industry itself obviously sees it, but I think every industry has seen it. I think a lot of people Mm -hmm. are reassessing and valuing what they want to be doing in life and they're making the changes. One of the things that I can say specifically for us is that typically through the business, we run 16 to 22% on, uh, on labor costs hourly, which is great. That's fantastic. But the thing that I, the thing that I always appreciate when I was looking at my, uh, workspace when I was in Sarasota is that. I was never hamstrung to having to look at people that were specifically only hospitality backed. So when I went in the job market and I was finding someone for my kitchen, I didn't need to find someone that had years of experience behind a grill or came from Johnson and Wales because they played it next to this uh-huh. famous chef. At the end of the day, I hired great people. And that was first and foremost, people that I wanted to be around. You know, we are operating a restaurant. You're in that restaurant a lot. I might see that person more than I see my own wife on yes, certain weeks. You're right. At the end of the day, I like my wife and I want to be around her. So if you're going to have more time with me than her, I better like you. So that was a huge plus for me as an operator. I was able to hire people that didn't necessarily have to be, you know, culinary trained because of the simplicity of what Melting Pot does. Mm-hmm. We just have to hire great, charismatic, responsible, fun people that make working alongside each other great. And the same thing for servers. You know, we do such a different approach to how we, you know, take care of our guests. You know, certain servers at restaurants, I think might have seven, eight, 10 tables or something. You know, they're running around just trying to get food on tables and you know, bust them as fast as they can. Typically restaurants and melting pot, they only hand out maybe two, three, four tables at a time. And what you're doing is you're truly serving them. They should know your name by the time they leave that restaurant. And that's what happens. On it. We're providing them almost a managerial hat because they're in charge of making sure that everything goes well, that they know what they're doing, they feel comfortable, they have the full service. If they have questions, they're answered and the service is prompt. And it's a team service with a lot of people and a lot of moving parts, but you don't need to have a server who's been in the industry for 20 years to hire. Again, I just hired great people. And because of the training that we have in place, we made great servers that stay with me for uh, six, seven, ten years. Yeah. Um, I even the store that I left to, to have this job I'm in now, which is franchising. Uh, I went over there, and there's still kids that I hired that are still in place that are still serving, not because they loved me, but they loved the brand, and they're still yeah. there, you know, happy. That's awesome. You know, I, I know our audience is paying attention to every word you're saying, but it really is. You can't train. Um, for personality, you can train Mm. for experience, you know, and it really is all about the personality of the people and do they work well together? Do they have the right approach? Do they have a true desire to serve the public? You know, it's, it's a camaraderie thing. There's such a chemistry in a well-run restaurant where it's such a fun environment to be part of. And that's on the guest side as well as on the team member side. So that's exactly on target. That's how we ran this as well. Let's talk a little bit about your hotel partner strategy. Now, Mm. Some locations are going inside hotels and are those smaller locations or are you finding bigger spaces and who are some of your hotel partners? So we are strategizing in order to uh, partner up with hotels to fill spaces underneath their brand and their title. So I, the best example we have is a, our store in King of Prussia. They share a space and parking lot with a hotel and because of the partnership, they help each other. They, you know, they share the same parking lot. They have the same uh, mm-hmm. guests. But what I think our ultimate goal and what we're trying to express to these hotels is that 
if you have a space that is open and you're looking for attention from the local community, as hotels kind of struggle to get because, you know, no one locally is saying, oh, I can't wait to spend money to stay in a place 20 feet from my house. They're mm -hmm. usually people from out of town. So mm -hmm. like, I think a right. lot of time the local focus for hotels is very is very shallow and very you know hard to get so what our job and uh, we're trying to do with this approach is to bring a world-class hospitality organization into a hotel of equal hospitality excellence and that partnership is great they know what they're doing on the hospitality end. they know how to keep the place great how to make sure that everything is looking fantastic around the hotel and then we bring in that local focus to have the hotel known as that's the hotel that has a melting pot. And I can't wait to go there on Saturday night. Now, that makes perfect sense also, because not every hotel has this issue. But one of the challenges of a hotel is people come in from out of town. They stay at a hotel, regardless of the price point, And their first thought is, I want to get outside this hotel and explore the community mm. and go to this restaurant that's, you know, in the middle of the downtown area, whatever it is. And re and hotels have sometimes struggled with keeping people within their dining operations for that very reason. But now your concept can hold a candle to any of those outside concepts in terms of excitement and fun factor. And you walk through the lobby and if you see this concept and the people bonding and celebrating over the fondue, it's like, Voop, I'm there. You know, that's yeah. that's my first thought. I think that's yeah. strategically powerful. You I know? think we draw Smart attention strategy. for I think we draw attention for hotels too to say yep. if there's an event that people are having, if it's business professionalism, if it's a bachelorette party if mm. it's a get together i mean we have the ability to bring those large parties in and, and seat them in our restaurant but keep them in that hotel and i think that's what you know is attractive to these hoteliers and what they're looking for which is an attraction to keep focus on their stores and bring in guests as equally as as much as we are nice we talked about the noble cause of saint jude's hospital but your company also has some core values around inclusion and diversity do you want to speak to that mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we essentially are a big, big proponent of everything we can do to make sure that anyone that comes to us for a franchise opportunity or employment, uh, they're seen in the same light as anybody else. Uh, so much so that at the corporate level, we actually have a diversity inclusion committee uh, led by a gentleman named Dan Stone, who's been with the company for 17 years. And we talk about that internally, we talk about that with our franchisees, and we talk about that at the employment level too, so that people understand where we are with these subjects and make sure that, you know, full transparency, we're an equal opportunity. We want everyone to understand and love melting pot. Awesome. So in terms of future growth, obviously this country is, you know, you've got locations in, in 30 plus states, like you've almost got coverage across the country. And now mm -hmm. is Canada a big push for the future or how about international, like European concepts possible? I mean, what's the future of melting pot looking like? We dabbled in international at one point, and unfortunately, it just didn't come through. But I would say the focus right now is here in the United States. I mean, there are so many cities that I see all the time because we actually invest with a company called SiteZoos. And this is an AI-driven algorithm that provides us with immense amount of tracking, data, even estimations of if I took a pin and dropped it anywhere in the United States, what would a rolling 12 months look like? And so we want to be able to say we have gotten every territory we can in the United States before we go elsewhere. And believe me, there, I've got great opportunities that I'm looking at all the time that I say, man, I wish I could just find the right person for this city because it looks fantastic. Wow. Sky's the limit. <laughs> That's fantastic. Is there a typical day for you at Melting Pot? I mean, every day must be different, but what what would your day like, your week be like? I I love the brand. I love the job. And so it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like work. I mean, I'm able to awesome. do a really nice job with uh, the corporate side. Uh, I work from home. Uh, and typically the folks at the uh, restaurant support center in Tampa are doing kind of a split. They do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday in-house and a Tuesday, Thursday work day where really what the company has said is, look, we want to give you time in order to, you know, focus on what your task is did all the information you need to get done and then actually convey it to everyone else on those Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So they do a very nice job making sure that we are taken care of and 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 doing our best for our franchisees. But as far as the restaurant life goes, you're you're with people that you love being around. Uh, and and that's the, my why I love my store so much. I still talk to my staff 
even now in this new position, I have old staff members that I, you know, wish happy birthday or hang awesome. out with. And, yep. they, you know, it's just nice because I was able to be around them and, you know, hang out with them as long as and much as I did. You know, they, they are friends and family, literally. So when you are part of a, you know, a fast growing organization, especially a franchise, consistency is absolutely essential. Is there a team that maintains somehow consistency? Uh, is secret shopping happening? You want to make sure that you know, the experience for the guest is the same at Topeka as it is in, Ta you know, in Tampa. What, how does that work? Yeah. I think the best way to put it is that every melting pot is held accountable to the brand and whole. And I think the best way that we can convey that not only to you, but in, like, future franchisees is that we don't hide secrets. We don't keep things from other franchisees because of, like I talked about with the locations and how spread out they are, they're not competing with each other. So when we have franchisee reunions, like we're about to in two weeks mm -hmm. over in uh, Puerto Rico, which, which should be a great time. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Those, franchise, those franchisees are happy to see each other. You know, they, they're in the same battle, but just in a different territory. So sharing what is working, what isn't working, things that they want to improve on. The balance scorecard is something that we keep and give to all of the franchisees. So there are a, a number, a number of factors that we're following. I mean, it could be as simple as, you know, sales, it could go into retail numbers, it could go into labor percentages, it goes into online reviews. But what we're doing is being transparent with our teams to say, if you see somebody on that list that's doing great at something and they're in the top, you know, five of the company, uh -huh. Uh -huh. call them, ask what they're doing, ask what their secret is, what are they doing that's different that you haven't found out yet. And so to do that is to create a great, uh, you know, openness amongst the community of franchisees that are working together in order to build sales. And you keep that consistency through the fact that you're trying to strive to be on that list as the best. But I would say we do a really nice job of making sure everyone is informed on, on the best way to take on their, their, their store. Best practices right there, shared strength, shared information, and a company that really cares about success for each individual unit or location. Yeah. That's fantastic. Callan, this has been awesome. We learned so much about the brand. You guys are doing so much right. And there were so many key nuggets that are perfect takeaways, whether you've got a single independent location, a small growing regional chain, large restaurant group. I think you provided some information that'll help everyone out in the industry and really appreciate you being a guest and, and what you're doing. Roger, my pleasure. Great to talk to you. Thanks so much, audience. That was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. We'll see you again real soon. Wow, Colin, that was so much valuable information and best practices and all about the dynamic concept called the melting pot and all the things that you do so well that is just an inspiration to our industry. And there's so many key nuggets and takeaways from our audience. We covered marketing. We covered company culture. We talked about beverage programs and, and the unique names behind things and special promotional nights and just creating added value for a guest experience, an interactive experience. It's really about celebration. So thanks for being here. It's been awesome. Thank you so much to our audience for tuning in. Thanks to the sponsors this week. And we can't wait until we see you in the next episode. People go to restaurants for lots of reasons, for fun, celebration, for family, for lifestyle. What the customer doesn't know is the thousands of details it takes to run a great restaurant. This is a high risk, high fail business. It's hard to find great staff. Costs are rising and profits are disappearing. It's a treacherous road and smart operators need a professional guide. I'm Roger. I've started many highly successful, high profit restaurants that I've now sold for millions of dollars. I'm passionate about helping other owners and managers not just succeed, but knock it out of the park. I created a game-changing system, and it's filled with everything I've learned in over 20 years running super profitable, super fun restaurants. Everything from creating high-profit menu items and cost controls, to staff training where your team serve and sell, to marketing hooks, money-maximizing tips, and efficiencies across your operation. What does this mean to you? More money to invest in your restaurant to hire a management team, time freedom, and peace of mind. You don't just want to run a restaurant. You want to dominate your competition and create a lasting legacy. Join the Academy, and I'll show you how it's done. Thanks for listening to the Restaurant Rockstars Podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.